They updated. They updated. Yeah, there. Yeah, thank you. The slides. All right. So, so, so here's the thing. If there are no questions, then if there are no questions, then we we continue off with the next order of business, which is lecture series number. Results are, are not. I'm I'm behind with marking. You know, when I was away, I, I didn't do a lot of work. So. Um, we, we are starting with the exams. Once, once we are done marking the exams for the half courses we are involved with, we shall mark the two pending quizzes, three pending quizzes now. So probably, I don't know, hopefully before the end of the week they shall be ready, right? <laughs> Behind. I apologize. We are slacking here, but we apologize. So here's the thing, right? Um, I mean, now that we know how a computer gets to, um, you know, co perform these basic uh, operations, computations, especially the math behind everything. The, the question is how, how then is this so-called data represented, right? This is what we want to discuss in, in lecture series number, number 18, right? Which is, um, I guess it's not, it's not that, um, it's, it's not that, uh, probably one of the easiest topics or lecture series we're going to cover just because I think most of the things we can easily relate to. But, but I thought, I thought we'd start with, um, well, things have changed here. Yeah. I thought we'd start by reminding ourselves of some of the things that, that we've, uh, we've looked at in the past. They will come back, you know, software and, and all those nice things we discussed. Uh, the fetch decode execute cycle. You remember that? Yes. Um, there's a link, it turns out that most of the things we are discussing are probably going to make sense if you remind yourself of what we were doing when we discussed that. And in fact, we did mention a while back that, uh, <clears throat> we did mention a while back that uh, most of the things we are discussing in this cause, this so-called cause are uh, interlinked. This is unlike uh, EDU 1010, I don't know if things are connected. Or it, it you ten twenty? No, it, I'm asking. It's a genuine question, right? It makes if things are not connected, it's a lot easier for you to get away with certain things. But if they are connected like this, for you to understand the things we're going to be discussing after this, by the way, you need to remind yourselves of number systems, right? Yes. For you to understand digital logic structures, you must go back here and remember this because this is coming back. For you to understand what we'll be talking about in the data path, you must remember number systems. Right, so if you're thinking, no, I'll study this towards the test or the exam, bad approach, right? <laughs> I wouldn't do that if I were you. All right, so we, we really, we, it's gonna be a short, a, short, um, a short session here. We just want to understand how text is represented by computers, how colors get to be represented, how images and videos are represented by a computer, how do we get to see the things we see on the screen, and, and really how, how does the computer, like in this case, how does my phone get to interpret the voice as I'm speaking here because I'm, I'm using a sound recording piece of software to record my voice going into the mic. So how does the computer get to transform the sound waves um, into digital form, right? That is important because at some stage, we'd have to reconvert the digital form into a form that we can hear, right? So how does that happen? All right, so just remind ourselves fundamental of what a computer does, right? We feed it input, it does a bit of processing, it gives us, <coughs> sorry? I'm sorry? Okay, so how do questions come, like, yes. How do questions come, like, Questions come, like, can you represent this in this format or? If, if you want to get a sense of how questions come, mm -hmm. log in into the Moodle after class, mm -hmm. go to the ICT 1110 course, go and look at class theory test number three and the final exam, and then you shall see how exams come. Okay, Is that, does that answer your question? <laughs> No, I'm, I'm being serious, and that'll give you an idea. And by the way, I don't think that they're going to be exactly the same. You just want, you want to understand. Don't think about the exam, think about understanding. It turns out when you understand, it doesn't matter how someone brings a question, you'll be able to answer it. But if you don't understand, it becomes a problem here. So we are saying, um, we, 
a computer takes an input, it does processing on that input, and then it, it spits out um, output. It turns out everything we are working with here is data. Right? Um, so what we are saying is that the computer accepts input data, usually in a form that human beings can understand. So before it can perform the processing, we, we actually got to understand how individual instructions are executed by the CPU. So um, there's a bit of, uh, you know, instruction, well, programs are loaded into RAM, and then individual instructions associated to that program are being executed, and really the execution involves instructions and data, right? Um, the processing, it turns out, involves manipulation of this input data, which is initially in a human-readable form, but it has to be converted in a form that a computer understands. The computer does the processing, and then it presents an output which it understands, but it has to be encoded in a form that we will also be able to understand. I, you notice that there's two different representations. The other representation is associated with the end users, people like you and me. The other representation is associated with the CPU. The CPU, is, we've come to learn, only understands ones and zeros. We don't know ones and zeros. If I was to ask you to say one, zero, two, two. If I was to ask you to say what is this, you wouldn't know, right? The computer does, right? So we need, there has to be a way in which this stuff has to be encoded so that we are able to understand this. Um, and really, if you think about it, for us to be able to accomplish this, all we have to do is to understand how fundamentally how text is represented, how colors are represented, how images are represented, and how sound is represented. If you know how to do these four things, these other forms of data that we get to play around with are derived from here. Video is derived from images and sound, for instance. Right? This slide here, this is pure text, right? It's a textual representation. Turns out this is a screen grab here, so this is an image and text, right? So everything we're working with on a computer is derived from these four different things. Right, so we start with textual representation. Um, we, we know that at a fundamental level, really, um, text, is formed from individual characters, right? And numbers, I guess. For us to represent the um, word hello, for instance, we know that hello is just nothing more than a combination of five characters, right? H-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E. right? Yeah? The reason why we want to think of representation of textual content in form of characters is because a computer behind the scene has some sort of mapping that is able to link the characters and numbers that we'll be working with, and special characters, by the way, like full stops, exclamation marks, and question marks, to binary values or binary equivalents. Um, techniques that are used involve using what are called uh, character encoding schemes, right? The simplest one being ASCII, it was one of the earliest encoding schemes to be used, uh, but these days um, Unicode is, is also popular, right? So what happens with ASCII, which is the simplest representation, is it uses 8-bit representation to provide a mapping between the alphabetical, the alphabet letters that we have, right, both uppercase letters and lowercase letters, so that's 26 of them. The numbers zero up to nine, and other special characters that you might end up using. So things like uh, space, for instance, uh, the things that you have on your keyboard. Uh, and really, maybe some things are beginning to make sense, like when you're setting up uh, an operating system for the first time, you are sometimes asked to say, can you type in this letter in the keyboard so that we, the operating system is trying to understand what sort of character set you're working with. Have you ever come across that? Yes. What you're doing behind the scenes is you're implicitly telling the computer or setting it up or the operating system to say, there's a particular encoding scheme that I'm going to be using. If you are from Zambia, you know that it's probably going to be mapped to the U is it US keyboard or something, or um, I guess a mapping close to the United Kingdom. 
Um, but if you're from China or Japan, it's different. If you're from some um, East European country, it's different. If you're from um, an Arabic country, it's different because the characters that you're using are different. Right? In most cases, much more than what we use. Right, so it's, it's quite simple, really. If you think about it, if we are saying ASCII is using an 8-bit representation, then what we're implicitly saying is that the number of special characters that we can represent using 8-bit representation is how many? 2 to the power 8. Which is just 256. So for us to be able to come up with textual content using ASCII, well, for, we, we are using implicit behind the scenes 256 characters, which is more than enough actually if you think about it. The alphabet alone only requires what, 26 plus 26, because we are saying uppercase letters and lowercase letters are represented using separate values. Think about this for a second. Alphabet is just going to be 26 plus 26. I don't know what the answer is here. 52. If, if you're working with text, let's say you're a math major and you're told to type an assignment that involves, uh, you know, formulas, addition, plus, equal sign, those are special characters, right? Um, but we also have numbers. What we're saying is zero to nine, for us to represent numbers, any sort of number, the numeric symbols that we use in decimal are what? How many of them? So already what we're saying is already for you to come up with textual content that just is a combination of English words or Chao and Bemba words or Silozi word because our alphabet is still A up to Z, right? All you need is just 52 of the 256 characters, right? But we know that some of us in here have uh, names where we use apostrophes and whatnot. This is where special characters come in. Can't quite remember how many special characters we have. The book that uh, I have shared towards the end has a uh, a complete ASCII table, not just a book. You can go here if you wish to. You, you see the complete ASCII table. Don't know how many special characters there, but it'd be just fun for us to just look at it so that we have an idea. Pause for a little while. Um, and by the way, the, the books, all the books are on the hub, I think. Not I think, I know they're on the hub, so if you if you wish to to use the hub. Um, so the so-called ASCII table looks something similar to this, right? Where you have, um, if people can see here, where you have um, specific characters that you're working with, right? Special characters and numbers and, you know, the key combinations that you'd, you'd, you'd want to work with. Control, is it control or to delete all those fancy things? All these are, uh, have a representation in binary that a computer will be able to understand. Uh, so find time and go through this. You notice that uppercase letters have a different mapping to lowercase letters. So uppercase I is different from uppercase a lowercase I, for instance. Right. Um, the numbers zero or nine. It doesn't necessarily mean that the number nine is interpreted by a computer as what is nine in binary. What is nine in binary? One, okay, what is one in binary using 8-bit representation? One. one. What we're saying is that it's not like the computer when we're working with, let's say one as an integer, it doesn't necessarily mean that the computer will convert the one that we type in in Microsoft Word and convert it to binary, no. It uses some sort of a table similar to this. You notice that uh, one is represented by the decimal number 49 or the hex number 31. So in fact, the computer views the one as, what is 31 in decimal? 
Uh, sorry, in binary. This one in binary. One, 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 zero, 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 one, one. one. Okay. Using eight bit representation. Zero, zero. So what we're saying is that the computer will not, when you, are, you have a one, you type in a one somewhere in some application, it's a notepad or, or Microsoft Word, the computer does not interpret that one as this, but instead it interprets it as this. I don't know if you're making sense here. Okay, so it's, uh, and, and this, all this, I guess, makes a lot of sense if you think, I think of it from the perspective of, of symbols, really, not numbers. Those zero to nine are symbols, they're not numbers. They're just symbols. Well, symbols we call numbers, I guess, in decimal, but I, I don't know if, if I'm making sense here. Yeah, I mean, one, one for, if we were to go back in time, like thousands of years, someone would look at this strange if we said, well, one, someone could say, oh, I don't want to represent numbers the way we do zero up to nine. Instead, I'll say this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, I'm sorry, this is four, right? We go on and on. Chinese person look at it differently, right? That's what I'm saying. So the mapping, whatever character set a Chinese person is using will map on the, the equivalent numbers um, into a form that a computer will be able to understand. The bottom line is this, typically a table, right? Unique, uh, using, if it's ASCII, then you're looking at the ASCII table that you're using to provide the mapping. So just as an example here, I mean, people last, last year had a bit of confusion, and so we, we, we did a bit of a simple walkthrough using the ASCII table to say, how would we be able to derive the binary equivalent of ICT 1110, for instance, right, using the ASCII table? All we have to do is, you know, gain access to our table, and we know that ICT, in this case, is our uppercase letters. We have three uppercase alphabetical letters, I, C, and T. We have the number, the number one represented three times, or the symbol one represented three times, the symbol zero represented once, and more importantly, there's a space after the T, between the T and the one. Right, so effectively, we have a total of about eight symbols that would need to represent for us to get the equivalent of what a computer will be able to see. Right, um, it's as simple as really we go and look at our ASCII table to find the uppercase letter I. We notice that the uppercase letter I is represented by the decimal 73 or the hex number 49. What we do is we convert the hex number 49 or the, the, the decimal 73 into binary using 8 bit representation. This is what we end up with. This will be our I. And then we, we look at our ASCII table to find C. We look at the hex or the decimal representation and then convert this to binary, again using 8-bit representation. Why 8-bit representation? Because we've been told that ASCII uses 8 bits. Again, there's a difference between lowercase c and uppercase c in this case, right? Not that it matters, we're just trying to showcase an example of how a computer gets to interpret this. We search for the t in the ASCII table, we see that it maps directly to the decimal number 84. So the question would be, what is 84 in binary? Or if you're using an ASCII table that has a hex equivalent, what is hex 54 in binary? Yeah, we find that this is the equivalent number there. Eight bit representation again. Okay? We check for one, one is right here and zero, actually we just combine them together. We notice that one is represented by hex number 49. 49 in binary is that, using eight bit representation. We have three ones, right? Um, and then the zero is represented by the decimal number 48. All we have to do is convert this 48 into binary. This is simple. If you are given, if you are given a table, if, let's say in the exam you have an ASCII table that has both the hex and the decimal, you can choose to use either the decimal to convert to binary or the hex. Uh, me personally, I prefer hex because all I have to do is split the hex number into individual symbols and then use four bit representation to derive the binary and then combine them. But if you feel comfortable using repeated division by two, do that, right? If there's ever a question like this. 
in the test of the exam. Is this making sense? But you notice that we, we've represented everything besides, besides the, the space here, right? Um, it turns out the space is just decimal 32 in, the, in, in ASCII or hex 20, right? We convert it and then we have this. So effectively what, what a computer will see when, when you, you are busy, whatever it is you're doing, let's say you are, I open up a new file and I say, oh, I type in ICT 11.10 and I save this. We know that the, when I'm saving this, this operation, there's something happening behind the scenes, right? The instructions being executed, instructions being loaded and executed. Program has already been loaded into memory, right? The instructions being executed and then I'm going to save this file here. As I'm saving it, for the computer to know what to save, it needs a way to interpret what I want to save. In this case, it's just a file that has this text. But for it to figure out what text I want to save, it needs to convert these things into equivalent um, machine code, things that it understands, right? And then it saves them. Simple enough, I guess. Uh, so computer will see this. I mean, if you've taken time, this, this application has come up a lot and I did mention that you were free to go out there and download other computer application software tools that could allow you to view um, things that are in human readable format into, let's say, hexadecimal machine code. So I'm using um, Octeta here. And you notice if I load this file in this, um, in this application, I get to see the equivalent of what I have in the file as ones and zeros. And it's like a direct mapping of what I have here. Right? I mean, if you're interested in understanding this a lot more, you can just go out and play around with simple files, just type in maybe one character and see what a computer sees and whatnot, right? But you need like some sort of application that will be a hex dump for you. Um, okay, and then just to emphasize, really try and remind us that if we are saying we're using 8-bit representation for, for a file that will have the text ICT space 1110, and we're using 8-bit representation, then what we expect is 8 bits is just one byte, right? What we expect is for the file to have a size of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right? So this is what we're trying to show here. The fact that if we save this simple file, right, and then check its size on disk, you notice that it corresponds to the contents that are in here. Size is 8 bytes. I mean, some other interesting things here is um, uh, sometimes you probably come across instances when maybe work, I don't know what sort of files you might have been working with, but you sometimes be asked what sort of character encoding scheme you'd want to use, especially if you're working with text, actually. If you work with comma-separated files, for instance, uh, Let's show by example here. Hopefully this works. The, usually the, the application software, the computer application software will sometimes ask you to specify what sort of character encoding scheme you wish to use, right? So observe, if I said I want to, uh, to, save, um, to save, I want to create a CSV file, comma separated file here, uh, not comma separated file. One of the things that this application I'm using will ask me to do is hopefully it does here, is it will ask me to specify. Is it not specifying the encoding scheme that I need to use, the character set that I want to use, right? By by default, it 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 tries to see what sort of character encoding you specified when you are setting up your parity system for the first time, because I think I, I've associated. Is it? Uh, is it US English or something with my computer somehow? By default, it thinks, uh, it assumes that I might want to, I'll be working on things that have to do with UTF-8, right? But if I was a Chinese person, perhaps I might want to use a different sort of uh, character encoding scheme. You notice some of them are pretty, I mean, they're pretty intuitive. Something to do with Korean, for instance, means that you're working with a character set that's going to correctly interpret the characters used uh, in the Korean, Korean language, whatever language that is, right? 
Thai, right? I don't know if they use Sanskrit, I can't remember, anyway. Uh, Western European uh, type of encoding scheme. So these are things to think about as you're working with, um, with, with, for those of us doing Chinese, for instance, you have a separate encoding scheme. And I don't know if you've been typing Chinese, maybe you've actually done this already. If you have, have you not done this? Huh, well, I don't know if you, for the language majors, I mean. Yeah, not every. Oh. No, I'm doing Chinese. That's unfortunate. I would if I were, as a, if I was a language major. Should think ahead, right? Think of what's happening around you. Okay, so you should think about what's going to happen to your life five, ten years from now. I would do that. Yeah, I would do that if I were you. No, seriously. They are here, right? And they're not going anywhere anytime soon. So you might as well adapt so that you, 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 you know. I don't know if I'm making sense here, but. No. It's not a major problem. Who, who told you that? You made a mistake. What you do is you, you go to the appropriate people. You should have gone to the HOD or the department. There are people that are doing Chinese in second year. What are you doing? They are done with that now. They want to be doing it now as a major. That's what they said. There the, are the, the things that can be done. You should have said this from the onset. Things can be fixed, right? It's not, things are not set in stone. No, you can't. It's, it's, you're done now. It's over. Um, so so the, the reason why you might want to use different encoding schemes, like I said, is you might be working with a different language. You know, far more character sets that you're working with. Um, if, if you look at the... If you just find time afterwards and just Google up... Uh, I don't know what character set, maybe not Chinese character set, but Mandarin character set or something, if that's a language. You notice that it uses far more characters than what we use in English, right? Uh, so these are things to think about here. And the more characters you have, the more um, symbols you'd need to be represented. So the larger the bit representation you'd be working with, yeah? So you'd no longer be working with a correct encoding scheme that uses 8-bit representation. Perhaps you'd use, you'd want 16-bit representation, right, 2-bit representation, yes. Do we have two masters? The what? The table. No. If, if there's a question, if there's any question related to this, just understand what we are aiming to understand is how text is represented. That's what we have to understand. If there's ever a question to do with this, you shall be given a table, an ASCII table, and say this is ASCII table, maybe you just have to know how to use ASCII table, which is pretty straightforward with really. its direct mapping here. Is this making sense, by the way? Well, I'm not tired myself. We... <laughs> we're not doing this for fun, we're doing this because we're catching up. And catching up is two hours. No. Not of loading. <laughs> Sorry? Really? See, we pause for a little while. I mean, um, pause. Pause. The, the reason, right? I'll tell you this. And this is, a, this is a problem with people in your age range, right? Turns out, for those of you that have done biology or that are doing biology, have done biology, notice that there, there's mention of uh, this thing, oh, well, the pre prefrontal cortex or something is still developing, the planning thing. You are not, you don't reason properly. There's a science behind this. No, it's true, right? You haven't, it doesn't, that part of the brain hasn't developed such a stage where you, you make rational decisions, right? So. When we went through the last lecture, instead of you reading up and studying and understanding things, you told yourself, it's fine, I'll do it later, right? I don't know, that's what, that's what most of you did, right? You can't, you find it hard, which is unfortunate, you find it hard to think long term. These things are going to pile up. Nobody's waiting for anybody here. These things are continuing piling up. We, I don't know if we've even gone halfway through with what we're supposed to be doing, right? And if you've noticed, it's like a video game here. The, the level is increasing, right? The level of, not the level of complexity, but maybe the, 
The stuff we are doing are more abstract and require a little bit of extra thinking. So if you don't read and understand the things that we've discussed before and you find it extremely hard to understand what we are covering, I'm deliberately pointing you back to what we've done in the past. Computer software. It's coming back, right? Most of the things, the screenshots that I keep bringing up here, computer application software, right? Well, for you to, to be able to use this, you need to know how to install it, right? You know, these things, the calculations we are doing, this is a simple, we are, we are direct mapping from, from base 10 to base two. How can you say you're tired about this? This is, I mean, it's like, it's, you can easily do it in your mind, I guess, I don't know. Do you need to sit down and calculate 2A in binary, really? Fine, how many people are tired and want us to go? <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't have to speak, right? I mean, <laughs> the expectation, right? It was really hard. I guess we it's not fine. We'll, we'll stop anyway. It's, uh, but we, we had, because uh, we started about 15.30 somewhere there. We still had about, you know, um, I guess 21 more minutes or something. To do. <laughs> but we can maybe, oh, yeah, let's just pause and maybe just a uh, little bit of breather. We'll continue this uh, Wednesday. You have a lot of time to catch up. Please read and catch up on this because the stuff that we are covering, after this actually we start what? MIPS. Yeah, we, we look at the MIPS architecture, right? The introduction to the MIPS architecture assumes that you understand these things we spoke about way back. A byte, a word, half a word, double word. That's what we're gonna assume. We will understand, what, once we start writing this simple assembly language program, programs, we will, we will assume that you know how to convert the integers that we'll be working with, the decimal values we'll be working with into binary. We will assume that you know, you know what this means here. Because this is, this, this is gonna come up a lot we will assume that that when, once because once we start using Qt spin, this is what you're going to see. Now this shouldn't be foreign to anybody because we know what this is. We everybody knows what this is, right? You know what this is. You know that this is. No, nobody in here will just claim that they don't. We know. If you haven't been reading, how are you going to understand these things here? How are you going to? Figure out what we mean when we say, at some stage, obviously, when we start looking at the architecture, we say, oh, registers in bits, uh, there are all these two bit registers we're going to be working with. You should know the range of integers, signed int integers that we'll be working with, right? Because we, we've discussed these things, right? Which, but, if, but if you want to, after this class, you forget about this talk and just sit there, maybe say, no, I'm taking a straw, I'm going to to window shopping, I don't know where you go to, maybe it's <laughs> somewhere. No, but it's true, right? You go there and you forget about this. Wake powers up, right? And really when wake powers up, it becomes a lot harder for you to go back and start studying, to catch up, right? Why? Because we've covered a lot. We are covering this course has a lot of things, a lot of concepts that we have to cover. When, when I did this myself, I did not do a course that combined what we've done. I did a computer systems course, I did a computer architecture course. Semester one, semester two, it was a lot easier for me. Surprise, surprise, you unfortunately have to do this together, right? At the end of it, or on the 20th of November, it's everything, right? All up to, I don't know if it's lecture series number 20 something, right? You know, so, okay, well, fine, we can, well, I guess we'll, st well, for number representation, I guess it's fine. We can we can pause for a little. While. I mean, I'm not um, I'm not some person who is just trying to say offload, right? I'm just not trying to offload these things. Right. So anyway, we'll stop here and then we'll continue off with color encoding on Wednesday. Quiz 11 and 12 will be ready by tomorrow. Latest tomorrow 06, but maybe before then. This we are recording, it shall be ready by that, so be on the lookout. Are there any concerns, I mean, before we go, I hate to lose time here, right? We, oh, you, we, we are done, but if you want to stick around and just chat about random things, 
Um, <laughs> no, I get paid for this time, right? I might as well use it. You're free to go, I mean, just like any. <laughs> Are there any questions you want? Things you want to talk about? Random questions, yeah? Yeah, this is just a, so we are saying, you notice that from literature, the UTF happens to be the most widely used encoding scheme. So I use it all the time, for instance, when, when we enter your marks and we want to upload them to Vula, usually in Vula, the Vula application requires that I import it as, as from a CSV file, a comma separated file with grades and computer numbers, right? The encoding scheme I choose by default is UTF-8. It's the safest option for me. I know that all these, the people that have uh, apostrophes in their names, hyphens, uh, if you have hyphens, those things would be represented. I, it's the safest option for me. So the question here is as homework, just go online and look up the most popular encoding schemes. Just, just try and uh, figure out why they're, why they're used, why they're commonly used, because it turns out there's always a reason why. Right? And then read up on the history of Unicode. It turns out there's a rich history behind Unicode as well. You know. Are there any other concerns, questions? I should have locked the door there, right, when coming in. Say, leave, but then you, you wouldn't leave. <laughs> it's, this is one, has anybody used Reddit? Reddit, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a social social networking platform. Reddit, Reddit, R R E D D I T. You have right. When you're searching for things, you probably come across like an answer on Reddit, right? Reddit normally has these. Uh, uh, AMA, right? AMA tags, right? It's like a ask me anything. It's a hashtag ask me anything. This is one of those sessions. If you have any, if you have no questions on what we've done, ask me anything. It could be related to ICT or something. Nothing. Sorry, negative? Negative? One zero one? One zero one in the stain to step to to binary. Okay. Step one, convert 10 base 10 into binary. I, 101 base 10 into binary. What is the answer? What is, you can use a calculator. I'll use mine. We don't have to go through this because we've done this already. We convert 101 into binary, right? Which is? 101 into binary. Yeah. One. Oh, one, one, one? One, one, uh -huh. zero, one, zero, one. Now, uh, you have to be smart about some of these things, right? Um, the, 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 the first thing that you have to, to ask yourself here, how many bits are these? Seven. Seven. The, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, because negative 101 is, is a signed integer, it's, it's usually safe for you to, first of all, figure out if 2 to power 7 is, is going to give you the range that you'd need to represent the number that you wish. I don't know if I'm, okay. When we convert 101, positive 101 into base two, we end up with seven bits. You might be tempted to assume that you're going to be working with seven bit representation, but ask yourself a question. Using seven bit representation, how many signed integers would you be able to represent? Our formula, negative two to the power Seven, uh -huh. two, positive two to the power. What is seven minus one? 
6. So 2 to the power 6 is 64. So already you know that whatever answer you are, are wanting to derive is going to have to use 8-bit representation. So to be on the safe side, what you would do then is you would say, right? And then what you would do then is you'd say, fine, uh, we'll go through the step. What is uh, one's complement of positive 10? What is one's complement? Right. And then what do you do? So the answer then is going to be And, and really, if you convert this now to decimal, so your answer, then negative, negative 101 converted to binary using two's complement is this. You can confirm this by going backwards, right? Yeah. Um, through this process. And in fact, uh, if you just do a direct conversion, you'll probably get the correct answer. Does this make sense? Does this answer your question? Ah, <laughs> oh. zero minus one zero one. <sighs> yeah, so I was trying to see if yeah, it's uh, this this calculator can't do what we want to do. Uh, You can easily convert. You can so you can you can do two things, right? Mm -hmm. To to confirm that what you've done is actually true, you work backwards using the approach we discussed. Mm -hmm. How do you convert to decimal using a two's complement binary number? Flip the bits. Thank you. We first of all flip the bits, so we shall have zero, one, one, zero. Zero, one, zero, zero. What next? We add a one. To the we add a one. one, and then? And then? Yeah, but is this decimal? What are you talking about? That's all, how can this be all? Okay, thank you. What is this in, what is this in binary? I mean decimal? Okay, and then? If this is 101, what's the next step? What's the next step? Yes, thank you. Now, I mean, so you might say, oh, but what if we're doing the wrong things and whatnot? What you can do is, uh, as you're working through these examples, I encourage you to just go online and then just do things like, uh, uh, just Google up uh, tools complement. Probably a bad one. If I were you, I'd be thinking about some of these things you're discussing. I'd be thinking about the everyday applications that we're using um, and ask yourself, well, but how does, how exactly does how, a complex application like Facebook, how, how would it, uh, how exactly do, do we get to see all those funny things? And this is probably one of those terrible converters, right? Can't see the answer here, where is it? I clicked, I clicked here, I think. Can anyone see the answer anywhere, no? About this company. Where? Where? Oh, thank you. Yes, I didn't see it. So the question is, does this conform to what we converted? Yeah. Right. So we are doing the right thing. Does this answer your question? 
I, I don't know why you were asking. We, uh, you were probably using 7-bit representation. Big mistake. You, uh, did, did you find, find it hard to convert it? The question is that we have to, after, after finding that answer, then we have to convert it in negative 19. No, this, this is small, so I just where was where was this? In the exam. Which exam? The one you made. Last year's exam. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> I wonder how many people got that right. I'm sure they. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions? Come on, ask. We still have uh, yeah. seven <laughs> minutes. Sorry, no. There, are, there are bound to be more questions. Please ask me. So everything we've done so far makes sense. It's crystal clear, right? No, no. I, I'm probably the most effective. I should be voted the most effective lecturer or something. Because, uh, yeah, because you understand. There are no questions, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm doing a good job here, right? I mean, so <laughs> yeah, I'm putting myself up there because. Sorry? Maybe we're just not sure what I have to Yes, there's a question. Yeah, okay. Uh, my neighbor can say what he's saying there. I can add up to what he's saying there. Yeah, we don't know. You know, you can't ask a question about something you don't know. So, we don't know what we don't know. So, no, no, but it, no, but, okay, maybe. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe that way. Yeah. Okay, fine. I mean, if you, if you, Fair enough. I mean, it's, it's, so, so my argument still holds, right? If, if at this stage you don't know what you don't know, then we've done a good job, right? Yes, because if, if there were certain parts that you were struggling to understand, like maybe I don't know how to you know, express ideas, then, then there would be a concern there. But, but because you don't know what you don't know, then we know that everything that we've discussed so far, which we know you know now because we've discussed it, you understand, right? So what we have discussed up to this point in time, we understand. Because there's nothing that you don't know you don't know, right? <laughs> no, no, but it's true. And unless if... Yes, and then the only problem... I'm That's killing the time here, just five more minutes, yes. Yeah, and the only problem is that you only find out what you don't know when you bring the questions. Questions, either in the quiz, in the test. Yes, That's what we found out, that we didn't actually know this thing. So now... Well, you know, we're talking about abstraction and stuff. No, the, 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 the problem Mwepa is trying to fall into here is the same problem that I've always wondered how long it takes to, to unlearn what was taught to you and to relearn things, right? If you understand, if you aim to understand, right? If you aim to understand what we're discussing, I assure you, you will find this course extremely easy. And it is an easy course, really, if you just aim to understand. But it's hard when you've been indoctrinated into this notion that you, know, you have to commit things to memory, and you have to read past exam question papers, and, try and, and then when the question comes, say, but this never came in the exam. It's not going to come, I mean, I assure you. There is not a single question in the current assessments that you will find in, in what you're going to write, never. It's not going to happen. I don't recycle questions. And the fortunate thing for us, right, for me especially for this course is there's so many things that you can pull questions from. It's a practical course. Endless pool of questions, right? Every, every time I'm online or talking to people, I'm thinking about, oh, this can be a nice question, right? That's how, that's how endless it is. No, serious, I'm doing it. So, and, and you know why I'm able to do that? Because I understand. Because I understand, right? So the point I'm trying to put across is, for things to be a lot easier for you, understand what we are doing. Do not memorize. Memorizing won't work. For some people, it might work. If you select few, you no, know, there are gifted people everywhere, right? There are probably one or two. We can see what you write. You are gifted. You can. For you, it comes second nature to commit things to memory. You can even memorize the ASCII table and just dump it in the exam. They're there, right? They are fortunate like that. They are gifted. But not everybody is like that. For the vast majority of us, we must understand. And you better understand because this thing is not going away. It's coming back next year. It is coming back in third year, not everything. They are coming back in fourth year. It's coming back in industry, right? 
Some of you are going to be teaching, like I'm teaching, some of you will be subnetting networks, right? Manipulating bits. You know, some of you will be working with fancy applications, cloud-based software. <laughs> People will expect you to understand what those things do. In fact, when you apply for a job, they'll ask you, right? Where's the cloud-based application? You're sitting there, we learned this, and I don't know. <laughs> but, no, but I'm being serious, I'm trying to give you realistic scenarios. These things are gonna come back to you. you don't understand this. Yes. It did come back for me, but when I, when I was being, sorry, pause for, for, for a short while. When I was being interviewed for this, for, this, for this job, right, I was still in school, so it was like a Skype interview, right? Now, if I didn't know how to use Skype, it was like, how are you going to do the interview, right? So Skype is a computer application software. And then, the questions they were asking me were elementary, some of them were elementary questions, networking, databases, things that I did many, many moons ago, because I understood it was, it was, that wasn't difficult. You know, coming up with a solution to the question was not difficult. You know, so if I were you, I would understand these things. They're not going away. The only way they'll go away is if you quit this course or if you take a different career path. You say, I will do the course and then afterwards I'll go and do something else. It will go away, but other, even though, I mean, still go away, still use software. Do you not create memes? You know, using Photoshop and whatnot. And turns out that it's a lot easier to manipulate bits and all those fancy things, right? I mean, to manipulate images, if you know how, how an image is encoded behind the scenes. Yes? On the understanding part that you talked about. Yes. It made me ask this question. Like, the importance of us figuring out the method that you in the range of bits that are supposed to work with using those formulas. Like, how does it help? Is it always that when we are given a number, we have to figure out the range that we are going to? Not always. If you look at, again, for those of you that have been memorizing the final exam, if you look at the final exam, right, for most questions to do with number systems, no, you, you have been, right? They were quite explicit. They said using 8-bit representation. Um, some of them, like for, I don't know if that was the test, test three or something, where we had a question to do with the IP address. The, the description was hidden somewhere in the description, somewhere in the question where uh, we're saying, an IP address is represented using dotted decimal numbers that each represent eight bits and whatnot. So it's up to you to figure out to say, oh, this one segment is, is represented by eight bits, this other segment is eight bits, right? So it, it's sometimes like this, you won't be told, so you have to think, right? Outside the box and realize, say, oh, this cannot be represented using seven bits, it has to be eight bits. Otherwise you end up with the wrong answer and, and I know some people were probably there thinking, like you calculate and recalculate and you can't find the answer. And you're thinking, what am I doing wrong? You know, you know what I mean, right? Yes. Because you're using seven bits, you're still doing the same thing over and over again. You won't get the answer if you haven't figured out that you first of all have to identify the range of numbers that you're working with. So some questions will, will explicitly tell you what to do. Some of them will not because part of what we're being assessed is to see if we understand. It's not to see how good we are at memorizing, but to see if we understand the course. And why is understanding important? Because it turns out that the basic concepts we are discussing in this course are coming back next year, third year, fourth year, when we leave and go into industry. So we better understand. Like they're coming back to me. These are things I did in what, 2004 or something? 2000, no, two, yeah, 2000, I did this in second year, so 2005, all right? This is, this is, it's back, for me it's come back, right? The chickens have come back to roost here. So for you, right, if you're gonna be teaching like me, once you start teaching as well, you'll be there, and some of you are, are going to be teaching like me, by the way. They recycle people here, if you're interested, from people that did the course, right? So from here will come people that will teach other people, just like they recycled me from a cohort of people that were once students, right? So you're going to teach these things. Now, what are you going to do if you didn't understand? Well, maybe you tell yourself, I will read when the time comes. Okay, fine, you will read when the time comes. Are there any other questions? I think we started slightly late. We still have a few more minutes, yeah? Yeah, we started late. Yeah? 2005, what do you mean? Not 1005. No, 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 I was in, I was in first year in 2003. That's a long time ago, right? What? Oh, before you started, I'm a... I'm a I'm a dinosaur. Sorry? <laughs> yeah? I was probably, 
Yeah. No, I was, uh, I'd have to go back in. I was probably like, I don't know, 17 or something. I just oh. <laughs> Sorry? That's what? Why. In, in first year? That's why. When I was, what do you mean? Yes. When I was in first year? Yes. Yeah, they just, uh, uh, there was just a year between high school graduation and me getting into university, That's just why. like anybody. That's, That's why what? <laughs> And this is a good armor question, right? No, no, this has no, no, nothing to do with that's why. The things that I was doing in first year, second year, third year, I never did in high school. What do you mean? It has nothing to do with that. No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's that's how it. How old were you when you first introduced your first computer experience? So, so when I, when I, I was like, I mean, when I got out of high school, I only spent um, probably like three, four months. I got a job. I was this is weird. I got a job. I was a, I was doing account stuff, right? Actually, this is that I, I was a costings clerk, and so I, but that was my initial introduction to computers. I had never used a computer. It was my first at work. That was my first time switching on a machine. There were no mobile phones back then, right? <laughs> you guys started using my uh, computers when? Uh, maybe when you were in grade no, nine or eight or something because you had access to mobile devices. <laughs> Even if they were not yours, but maybe mom and dad had devices or brothers had devices. So I, I, I mean, I, I started using a computer when I just graduated high school. But really, my, my use of a computer was restricted to data entries. So it was mostly Excel because it was accounting. Uh, and the stuff I was doing was just data entry. It was a cotton processing company. I think they're called what now? They were cotton now. They've rebranded. They were bought by some major company. I don't know what they've rebranded. Sorry? Yeah, I grew up there. That's where I grew up. So, so it was mostly like Excel, and it was just switching on the computer. And then I got introduced to the world of the internet. And I used to spend a lot of time on the internet. right? So it was the internet, like Internet Explorer, and the spreadsheet. That's all, data entry, right? You know, open the spreadsheet, save, and whatever. And for, for, unfortunately, right, I only spent a few months, and then I, I got into school, and then I spent another year without using computers. I only started using computers because first year in NS is uh, just like uh, those natural sciences, right? So I only got to start to use computers again when I was in second year. It was like starting from scratch, really. Um, so there's no difference between you and me. <laughs> no, seriously, there's no difference here. I, sorry? Are there any other random questions? So, sir, by the age of 16, you were a diamond, I I would have to check. I think so. Yeah, I think so, because I was. <laughs> well, so the thing is, my, my birthday is somewhere. Right before you write the high school exams, right? So let's just say by 17, not 16. No, there's no such thing as being a genius. Now, I, I went to school with... Uh, I, you know, so the, the thing, right? There's, there's nothing like... It turns out that there's nothing like... Uh, well, they're gifted people quite right. But um, there are different kinds of people. There are people that are generally gifted where you... You kind of like read up on something and understanding is second nature to you. You don't have to read it over and over again. There are people that are just, well, there are people that are hardworking. They've realized, right? They've reached the stage where you realize, say, so for me to get the results I have, I need to really put in work. So they work really hard, right? Um, I don't I think I'm the one that works hard. <laughs> I don't think I'm a genius. But, um, but it turns out, you know, you know how I think you've reached a stage where you probably came from a school where you are probably one of the best performing students, which is usually the case for you to be here, you're best performing student. You come here, you find people that are probably better than you. This is what happened with me, right? I thought, I'm there, I'm thinking, well, I'm good. I mean, you come here and you meet. I guess this is what makes this interesting. And I'm trying to piggyback on something. Part of what makes this whole experience interesting is to work with other people, right? I'm sure you've already figured out who is good at what. Right now at this level, there are people that are good at maybe number systems or ICT 11, 10. You know, take advantage of those people, right? You won't learn everything you need to learn from Lighton and Nonden. No, it doesn't work like that. You contact hours with Lighton is three hours in a week. What are you going to learn there, right? It's just introduction of concepts, and maybe if you come for during office hours. Contact hours with Nonde four. 
hours, right? Is it two hours per week? Turns out you learn more from other people and from reading up, doing research, right? Read. You can't understand by just going through the slides. So, yeah. Uh, and by the way, don't feel bad if you, you're finding this hard. Um, at, by the time you get to fourth year, I think you understand the, the beauty of collaboration, right? You realize that once you get to third year, you might become good at some of the courses we start doing because the, the courses that you'll be doing get to cover different concepts. Not everything is maths. There's a more practical stuff like programming next year. There's more maths and computer mathematics, but there's computer security. So it might turn out that there are people that are not really doing so good in this course that will become good at that. Uh, and, and again, to pick back on that, that should probably act as a hint to say, no, maybe I should explore this area more so that by the time I'm in fourth year, I become an expert in this field, right? By the time I was in fourth year, I'd done a lot of experimentation. I started interning when I was in second year. Stop going home, right? I'm going home, go home, go do what, right? So I started interning, I would remain, and then I would uh, find work, right? You work as an intern, you get to practice, and I realized by the time I was in fourth year that the stuff that I really liked the most was the software part. And that's the path I chose. By the time, um, you know, I, we started taking those electives, I, I carved out, well, it wasn't elective, it was actually a, a, you major, like in CS. I majored in software because that's what I liked, right? By the time I was looking for a job, I mean, preference was given to things that I knew would involve a bit of software. Although when you're job hunting, I guess you don't really yes. ch cherry pick, right? But, but still, uh, we've reached in the age, this is the age of startups. Don't think of jobs, let's think of startups, right? Yeah. The what? Well, so, okay, so the way this program is structured, it's different from mine, actually, the one I did. There's a, an explicit requirement for you to intern, and I think you're kind of like helped to find places in certain instances that, is that third year or fourth year? But there's nothing stopping you from taking the initiative it doesn't have to be, right, I'm not saying you should remain here. You could go back home, maybe potentially find something you can do that will involve you using your computer skills. In fact, these days, right, I forgot to do that when we did the, maybe we'll do it in the April towards the end. These days you can make money online. <laughs> you don't have to work for somebody. I'm telling the truth here, you can make money online just by having access to the internet. These bundles that you buy, don't waste money on YouTube. People are making money online, by doing simple things, right? Yeah. <laughs> Crowds, if you Google up Amazon Mechanical Tech, for instance, if I were you, if you have nothing better to do at home instead of um, being up to no good, start, <laughs> start making money online, right? <laughs> Sorry? Well, I mean, um, well, I guess the thing I can think about right now is like Amazon Mechanical Tech, there's these micro tasks that people give out uh, you could be transcribing things and you're paid a small little amount, but it accumulates with time. That's something that requires very little thinking. Usually the prerequisite is you must know how to use it, maybe a particular piece of software or something. But there are no number of things that you can do online, right? The, your friends are making, if you look at the, the your friends your age group are making money on, online by doing stupid things like monetizing their YouTube channels. How many have a YouTube channel in here? Boo hoo, no. whoa, okay, fine. That's like less than half, right? Maybe less than a quarter, actually. What are you doing with the YouTube channel? Have you uploaded any video there? What, here's the thing, right? What's stopping you from creating a channel, and then once you read up and understand how to, to work out tools complement, you create a simple uh, screencast that shows people how to use tools complement. You get paid by, Shyness? I mean, those who you are, create an account that will be called XX2002 or something. Nobody will know. You can be. So when you have what happened? You've seen some. Well, so. So. So, let me just show you something. So, if. So. And, and you should think outside the box here, right? So. So,
Now, this is, my, 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 my videos are bad examples because these are esoteric things. Um, these are really esoteric because when I upload things, the views are, there are, there are very few people that would be interested in, in, in um, trying to figure out how to calculate two's complement or something, you know what I mean? The number of views that you attract are, are not comparable to, ah, uh, come on. Try YouTube today. I wanted to show you something. It turns out that uh, for for each, and I hope I'll be able to see this. So for each, so for for each, like all the videos that you that I upload here, right? There's this mechanism that Google uses called uh, paper paper click or something. So a, a click has been converted down to a monetary equivalent, right? So usually when you have more views on a video and more likes, you end up making more money. So uh, let's see if, uh, the, have they, the, no, it's actually actual money. What do you mean talk time? I don't know what's happening here. I, I'll probably have to. Well, I mean, I, I can't. Um, yeah, we, we are done, but we can go. But <clears throat> I was trying to see. You know, there's, there's, you can do simple things like. Um, I'm trying to see if I can see my monetary equivalent in, in AdSense. I think I should because I've linked my, my Google account to AdSense. But, but in my case, right, and I've, I've, been, I've been a bit complacent with this just because I'm, I'm not really, I think I've, I've become content with the fact that my, my this is little money, no. But that's because my thing has been dormant largely. I think this, this has everything I've done so far. Let me see. No, 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 just let me let me see if I can. This is just in the last seven days, right? Let me see if I can check three months or something. This is my my dead. This is a combination of I guess my my. Uh, why isn't this thing? I haven't used this in a really long time. I'm trying to. <laughs> yeah, this this is in the three lines is like a, I guess it's like a, almost three three quarts or something. This is, this is. But, but but here's the thing, right? This is this this is this is a bad example. This is a thing. This is, do, do you know? Do you know? This is a bad example. Do you know why it's a bad example? The last, the last blog post that I have on my channel, most of this money is coming from my blog. The last blog post I did was three years ago. Right? These are odd things that I have, right? This is the reason why there's, there's very little money coming from, from, from here, which is bad, really. And also, how many people in here would be interested in viewing maps of historical voting patterns, for instance? And, and also, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't abuse my my, my, my sites, like Lusaka Times or Zambian Watchdog, where you find uh, an ad here, Japan vehicles here, everywhere, right? If you notice, if you come to any, any of these, these blog posts, I only have one strip on top here. So the money I make is potentially from people that would find an ad interesting here and click the here. But if I wanted to make more, and I'm content with this because the money I make, it turns out, per year, is enough to pay hosting fees for this domain. Which is fine, it pays itself. I don't, I'm not. You have to pay for it. Yeah, this is not free. You have to register the domain, you have to um, pay hosting fees every year. You have to renew the 
domain name as well. Right? So, so for me, I'm content with that, which is why, but a bad example is there's more money, there has to be more money here. I, I just don't know how to, this is this month, let's see if. Bad example, they've changed AdSense um, a lot and I haven't, I haven't really checked AdSense in a long time. But the, the bottom line really is that, uh, the last seven days, let me go to all time, I guess. But the, the bottom line is, um, is you need to, you need to, yeah, I don't know if this is, this is all time, I mean, it's like, a, I guess it's like 3,000, the money I haven't yet redeemed is like 3,000, for 3,000 quite, which is nothing, right? I know, right? But, but this is, the thing here, the thing to think about, the thing here is that, uh, the, yeah, but nothing compared to what you could make if you were serious about this. These are things you should be thinking about, by the way, not thinking about who is going to employ me after it. There's more money in doing your own things than other people doing things for you. But, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's easy to make even more. This is why when you're visiting these sites like as Zambia reports or something, have you ever wondered why there are ads everywhere? Money. If you wondered why people are continuously uploading pranks on YouTube, you feel happy just viewing those pranks. They're making money. People are making money just by live streaming, playing a game, right? You're doing something fun, something you enjoy doing, and you're making money out of that, right? These are things you should be thinking about, but, but the problem with you is instead you'd rather go on Facebook and update your status <laughs> and gossip, right? <laughs> and, and really, if you, you are strategic with this, especially if you're part of an association, I mean, you could, uh, your friends elsewhere come up with uh, student magazines online, like portals where you, because it turns out you have more time to research and share or th like information that people would find useful. You can crowdsource that, that stuff, right? Come up with some site where contributions are solicited from the entire group, NICT 1110. You monetize that, you make money. I don't know how you come up with a scheme of distributing money maybe based on contribution or something. These are things to think about, not, not thinking about what, what you're going to do. You're going in the TV room today and watch soccer or something. I don't know if the TV rooms are still there in the ruins or something. Yes? So, yeah, before we finish talking about this, I think you say something about when you specify today you want to go into software, and then you talked about computer security or something like that. Is it the same thing with us that maybe by fourth year we'll have a chance to say, I want to concentrate on this part? So the choosing, <clears throat> no, the choosing is implied. The choosing is based on, on the elective courses that you choose to take. And I think you start taking, I don't know if you start the electives in third year, of fourth year, right? So there are people maybe that are going to decide to do, I think there's an elective to do with networking. So even though you've been introduced to networking, fundamental networking, fundamental concepts in 1020, you've done that, right? You understand how the internet works and all those funny things. But once you go and do, um, once, and that's important, you must, you must be paying attention to that course. That's really important, right? Once you get to fourth year, you start doing that, um, there's, a, there's an elective called, uh, is it, Computer networking and data communication or something. This is mainstream. That's like a, you, you get to look at the things that you only scratched on the surface in 1020. You look at them in great detail. Um, so you better be paying attention to some of these courses. Don't just sit and pretend like, uh, like you think it's just for the exam. No. Those are important concepts. They're coming back. Right? Uh, so, so, yeah, so it's implied. The, 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 the choosing is implied, so it's going to be based on what you're interested in. And hopefully the assumption is, by, by the time you get to fourth year, come on, you spend what? Three years already, you understand things, you know what interests you, you figured out what you think is, is a niche area, right? Um, the uh, Zambia is open season, there are a lot of opportunities. I mean, if you go to the app store, how many of you have bothered to check how many apps have been developed by Zambians? And if you look at, if you look around you, whenever you get on a bus or you are walking to arcades, countless problems that can be solved by just creating those apps. Turns out, you can easily monetize those apps. I have a friend of mine who's really going deep into Android app development. He does that like, he's obsessed with that. It makes a, a killing by just doing simple things like is this. 
he's Christian, I guess, and he, he mostly develops his Bible-centric apps, and he makes a killing, right? He's identified a, a niche area, right? So, but there are a number of problems in Zambia that can be solved by just creating apps. This is load shading. How do people know, right? That would be like a, a widely used app if there was an app to check. I don't know, maybe it's there. There's an app to check when power is going. You know there's load shading, right? Maybe power doesn't go at once. There's a schedule, right? <laughs> Every month. Instead of me going to this website and downloading that from just an app where I just tap and check the schedule. People are interested in the simplest of things. The most widely viewed article on my blog, this is a Terex app. It's a simple, very simple thing that I did when I was bored. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't do anything. I was so bored to death, but I created a simple form where people just enter the money that they make per month, and then it gives them back. And this, I feel ashamed for doing this, this is a simple thing, right? It gives them back the net payment and the tax that they pay. Simple, but the, the views that I get from here are ridiculous. Well, it's not a lot of likes, but 270 shares, 127 likes. Uh, you can't see the views here, but 22 comments, a lot of engagement, 6,000 views. What I'm trying to say is there are serious problems around us that require very simple solutions. Solutions that you can implement in just a weekend, actually. Boom. And then after you implement after a weekend, you can get maybe some passive income and some recognition. It turns out recognition can be translated to money, right? Fame. People will know who you are. I'm ashamed. I, we went to H. HEA, High Education Authority, right? And we had this meeting, and uh, this, this professor one where it goes like, ah, is this a light on, is this the same year? And I'm like, oh my God. People are knowing me for the wrong reasons, right? They shouldn't know me for trivial things, you know? But, but recognition, people know, at least they know me, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, but, but these are things to think about, really. and, and it turns out, and in closing, I think we, I'm glad we didn't uh, steal time, but in closing, yeah, time snatchers, yeah. I don't want to be accused, say, he never showed up in two lectures. We have, we've got to cover everything here. But, um, what was I going to say? <laughs> I don't know. I forgot it. Sorry? No, so something else I wanted to say. I don't know what I was going to say. Yeah, I've forgotten. I've lost my train of thought. No, it has nothing to do with recognition per se. Sorry? No, that was just a, by the way, <laughs> yeah, we're tracing back, right? I think it's old age or something, but, 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 um, but really, we should be, oh, there we go. If you think about the big ideas, and I've, I think I've spoken to some of you about this, sorry for repeating this, but reputation is a matter of skill. Think about all the wonderful ideas that people have come up with. There's a good number of them that originated from an environment like this one. Facebook was born out of a dome. Google was born out of a garage when two graduate students, people that were pursuing their PhDs, were busy trying to solve a problem. Most of these things were born, a lot of groundbreaking ideas, it's just unfortunate that we don't do this. A lot of groundbreaking ideas can easily be, um, I, I guess, pioneered by people like you, because you have the time to read and research and think. The only thing you do is go, come to class, go and read and think. What else do you do, right? Yeah. Nothing, you know, you read and think. The government, I don't know if the government is paying, the government pays you, you go and read and think, right? Read, think, read, think. Why can't you? <clears throat> you know, so it is my hope that uh, by the time we get to fourth year, maybe we can do a lot of nice, in closing, maybe we can do a lot of nice things. We should be thinking in this way, really. Uh, guys, I shall see you day after tomorrow when we continue our discussion of, uh, we are behind time, we need to continue here and we, we need to get this out of the way. But I'm, I'm, I think we are on schedule here. See you when you see me. Thank you. Yes.
Okay. Oh, you can read. Go and read and research. <laughs> hey, guys, someone is asking about, oh, no, I want to create a blog and whatnot. I taught EDU 1020 last year. You have been taught content management systems. Nobody has to teach you anything. Okay, they, maybe they'll, they'll teach you content management systems. You do that. I taught that. I mean, so and the, the, so the, the blog I was showing you, my blog is, I mean, it's implemented using a content management system, WordPress. So when they teach you that, pay attention. When they teach you that, you can easily do that. Easy stuff. EDU 1020, very important course. I'm working with some fourth years. They sit there and, and they don't, they're finding it hard to do some simple Excel functions. And I tell them, we did this in EG1020, I taught EG2020, I know. We use this application, Open Refine, in, in this research methods course. You did this at second year, I know, right? These things are coming back to you. Good luck. I'll see you when you see me, which is Wednesday, bright and early, right?